One of the most iconic and talked about theme park resorts in the world, a vacation destination for the entire family to enjoy, seems as though Universal is finally coming into its own with new hotels and attractions and epic plans on the horizon. Whilst not as complex as the House of Mouse down the road, newcomers planning the best possible trip may need a helping hand. Hi, I'm a Frugal Brit and for this video I'll be providing an updated and hopefully improved beginner's guide to Universal Orlando Resort. It's a four part video covering Universal Studios and Islands of Adventure attractions, dining, city walk, volcano bay, tickets, express passes and hotel resorts with timestamps so you can easily skip past anything you don't need. If you're headed to Universal anytime soon, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for future Universal Orlando content. <laughs> Starting with the super simple basic stuff, so it all began as a single theme park, Universal Studios Florida, but in the following years we've seen it evolve into the huge Universal Orlando Resort complex to rival the nearby Walt Disney World Resort as a multi-day vacation destination, now boasting two theme parks, both featuring their own Wizarding World of Harry Potter lands, which you can travel between via the Hogwarts Express train. To get to the theme parks, guests will have to travel through the City Walk Entertainment District, which is Universal's dining, shopping and nightlife hub. Surrounding City Walk on all sides are eight different Universal Resort hotels within four different price categories. To the west of our map, we have the Volcano Bay Water Park, which Universal's marketing team does often like to refer to as their third theme park, but most classic as a water park, albeit a beautifully themed one. But a legit third theme park for Universal Orlando is currently in the works. Universal's Epic Universe is scheduled to open by summer 2025. I'll link to the latest information on this in the description. So that is the lay of the land when it comes to Universal Orlando. So now it is time to take you guys on an updated attraction tour of Universal Orlando's parks. Universal Studios Florida opened in June 1990, inspired by Universal Studios Hollywood and its flagship studio tour attraction. Today, Universal Studios Florida has the same P-shaped layout around its man-made lake and contains little of its original attraction lineup, but still features movie and TV themed rides and shows. We'll begin our tour on CityWalk's East Bridge, over the Universal Waterway that connects most of the resort hotels and next to the iconic Universal Spinning Globe. The equally iconic Universal Archway entrance takes guests through the turnstiles and into the first land of our tour, which is Production Central, originally themed to Universal Studios production facilities and sound stages, but its main avenue will soon get a Minions retheming. Our first attraction within Production Central, within a few yards of the turnstiles, is the Despicable Me Minion Mayhem Motion Simulator ride, which no longer requires 3D glasses, which most consider a downgrade to the experience, but still a lot of fun. Given its location near the entrance, I recommend experiencing it in the late afternoon, unless you can be there first thing at Rope Drop. On the opposite side of the soon to be rethemed avenue is the upcoming Illuminations Villain Con Minion Blast, due in summer 2023, which will replace the former Shrek 4D attraction. If we head north down the avenue, we'll arrive at the Music Plaza stage. Below this is the Rip Ride Rocket Steel music themed roller coaster. Guests are required to drop their bags off at the lockers. Compared to Disney World, lockers do play a much bigger role, but fortunately small lockers are complimentary if bags aren't allowed. More info on lockers in the video description. But back to Rip Ride Rocket, guests get to choose the genre of music they want to hear for the ride before they ascend a terrifying 17 story hill that leads to a steep drop towards a number of twists and inversions and weaves impressively through the park's New York land. If we head east towards the central lake, we'll eventually come to the Transformers The Ride 3D, which is a multi-sensory 3D dark ride. Guests enter under a 28-foot tall statue of Optimus Prime before being transformed into nest recruits to help save the planet, and you'll be joining Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, and Sideswipe to protect the Allspark from Megatron and his villainous Decepticons. Transformers fans may also be interested in the nearby character meet and greet. For the second land in our tour, we're going to double back towards the Music Plaza stage, then we're headed north of this for the New York land, where the streets of the Big Apple are recreated in this production-ready backlot containing meticulously crafted facades that include all the wear and tear you'd expect from real-life storefronts. On the east side of New York, there is the Race Through New York starring Jimmy Fallon 3D Simulator ride, which is housed inside a replica of NBC's iconic 30 Rock offices in Manhattan, where The Tonight Show is taped and contains a mini-museum of The Tonight Show. In the upper level, guests are entertained with live daily performances from the Ragtime Gals Barbershop Quartet and interact with Hashtag The Panda before being led to Jimmy Fallon's studio for a 3D adventure through the streets and subways of New York and the moon. 
After exiting Race Through New York, we'll take the short walk down Fifth Avenue. And on the left hand side is the Revenge of the Mummy combination dark ride and roller coaster based on the Mummy movie series starring Brendan Fraser. Guests enter the ride through the massive Museum of Antiquities facade under the premise that you'll be touring the Mummy movie set. The ride begins as a slow dark ride and passing through various chambers. Guests soon learn that the mummy Imhotep is trying to gain immortality by feeding on the souls of guests who experience a number of impressive special effects from flames and fog to animatronics through speeds of up to 45 miles per hour and a 40 foot drop. On the other side of Fifth Avenue is Delancey Street, where the Blues Brothers show resides, based on the 1980 movie and featuring Jazz and Mabel, who were later joined by the Blues Brothers Jake and Elwood, who take the stage to perform several songs, including their signature Soul Man tune. For those looking for more live entertainment in the area, then you also have the Sing a Cappella group on the same street, and on Fifth Avenue you have Marilyn and the Diamond Bellas show. For the first time in our tour, we're going to walk along the waterfront towards the top of the park for the San Francisco Land, one of the smallest lands within Universal Orlando. Based largely on San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf, complete with a replica of the famous clock tower in Girandelli Square, featuring a few different dining options. Tucked away on the pier next to Lombards is the Jaws replica, a sad reminder of this land's better days when the Jaws ride reigned supreme. Today, San Francisco features just the one attraction near the clock tower, which is Fast and Furious Supercharged, a car chase motion simulator ride based on the Fast and Furious movie series. Guests are taken through a garage full of cars and real props from the movies. After boarding the 48 passenger party buses, guests then ride along with Dom, Letty and Roman on a high octane street chase and through a 360 degree projection tunnel on hydraulic platforms featuring some hilariously cheesy over the top moments. For our fourth land in the tour, we're going to head over the water back towards the entrance for the Hollywood Land, right next to Production Central near the front of the park. Guests enter the heart of Tinseltown for Universal's Hollywood Backlot, featuring historic Hollywood landmarks to recreate the glamour of Hollywood's golden age, including Schwab's Drugstore and Mills Drive-In. Our first attraction when entering from the park entrance side is the Bourne Stunt-tacular live action stunt show, contained within an Art Deco office building. Guests are led into a large waiting area where they're briefed on Project Rubicon before heading over to the 700 seat virtual surveillance observation room where you follow Jason Bourne as he outruns sinister characters through rooftops and helicopters. If we walk up through the Hollywood Hall of Fame, past Mel's drive-in, we'll come to the long-running Universal Orlando's Horror Makeup Show, one of only two attractions still in operation since opening day, which resides inside a recreation of the Pantages Theater. After viewing the horror movie displays inside the lobby, Guests enter the theatre for a live demonstration of Universal Pictures' legacy of horror movies with particular emphasis on prosthetic makeup and hilarious improvisation with the audience. If we head towards the lagoon, we'll arrive at a dedicated viewing area situated in Central Park, which hosts the cinematic celebration nighttime spectacular using 40-foot wide water curtains as movie screens, featuring scenes from famous Universal movie franchises performed once a night most days of the year. If we head south of Central Park, we'll arrive at the artist formerly known as Woody Woodpecker's Kid Zone, which is currently undergoing quite a big transformation, with most of it currently closed for construction, which includes Feeble's Playground, Woody Woodpecker's Nuthouse Coaster, the Curious George Goes to Town Water Play Area, and DreamWorks Destination. The land is currently rumoured to return as a DreamWorks-themed land containing characters from the likes of Shrek, Trolls and Kung Fu Panda, but nothing set in stone as of yet. But at the time of making this video, guests are still able to experience the two main attractions over here. The first of which is the Animal Actors on Location, which is a live show featuring performing dogs, birds, pigs and a menagerie of other animals in a covered outdoor stadium. The second attraction still in operation is E.T. Adventure, a dark ride inspired by Steven Spielberg's 1982 film. You'll take a winding path through the towering forest of trees to bicycle-shaped suspended ride vehicles before taking to the air over the city and into the stars, eventually arriving at the Green Planet and greeted by a brightly lit group of friendly animatronic aliens. A short walk north will take guests to the Springfield home of the Simpsons land, which aims to recreate parts of the colourful animated town from the long-running TV series, containing recreations of Quickie Mart, Moe's Tavern, the Jebediah Springfield statue and other landmarks. For our first ride in Springfield, we have Kang and Kodo's Twirl and Hurl alongside the lagoon, a themed aerial carousel with spinning ride vehicles shaped like small spaceships, fitted with controls so guests can rise as high as 10 feet off the ground. 
Opposite Kangen Kodos is Springfield's main attraction, The Simpsons Ride, where guests are transported to the Krusty Land theme park with custom carnival games surrounding the giant Krusty the Clown head entrance. The colourful queue takes guests to Krusty's Carnival Midway before taking to Krusty-shaped ride vehicles that face an 80-foot IMAX dome that simulates an adventure through the Krusty Land theme park filled with jokes and Springfield sights and sounds and Sideshow Bob in hot pursuit. On the far east of the park is the nearby futuristic looking World Expo Land, which has seen a lot of changes in the decades following the park's opening, with only one attraction remaining in this shrunken land. It contains the space age Coca-Cola kiosk, where guests can fill up their freestyle cups and cool off in the air conditioning. The sole attraction is Men in Black Alien Attack, an interactive dark thrill ride. Guests enter the pavilion building expecting to see a World's Fair exhibit before being asked by an agent to become a new recruit for the MIBs in their secret headquarters. Guests are loaded onto six passenger spinning ride vehicles fitted with laser guns and taken into a training room, but training is cut short when it's revealed that an alien spaceship has landed in New York, requiring you to help save the city and defeat the aliens whilst competing with your friends and family for the highest score. With only one land left in our Universal Studios tour, we'll head towards the top of the map where the Jaws ride used to live for the most immersive land that Universal has ever created, the wizarding world of Harry Potter Diagon Alley. Whether travelling from World Expo or San Francisco, guests arrive at the London waterfront lined with authentic London-themed facades. At the top, you'll find Creature and Grimald Place and the Wyndham's Theatre. Guests can also interact with Stan Shunpike on the night bus, on the west side, there's an impressive recreation of King's Cross Station, which we'll be heading inside later in the video. For now, we're headed for Diagon Alley, hidden away from Muggles behind the brick wall next to Leicester Square Station. Entering into Diagon Alley is without a doubt one of the most magical theme park experiences, with a fire-breathing dragon perched atop the dome of Gringotts Bank. Between the brick wall entrance and the dragon are a number of familiar wizarding shops along the cobblestone streets including the Ollivander's shop, as well as the Leaky Cauldron quick service restaurant. Next to this is a dark and creepy pathway for Nocturne Alley, containing spooky special effects in the shop windows. To the east of Diagon Alley, you'll find the Car Kit Market section, which hosts live shows, including Celestina Warback and the Banshees. You can also stop at the nearby Gringotts Money Exchange, where you can trade your US currency for Gringotts banknotes. Diagon Alley has just the two attractions. Its headliner is Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts 3D Dark Ride Roller Coaster Hybrid, located at the top below the dragon inside Gringotts Bank. Guests enter its elaborate queue and through a marble adorned lobby filled with animatronic goblins hard at work. After watching two fun pre shows, you're taken into a bumpy elevator which sends you nine miles into the ground with convincing projections. After boarding the ride vehicles, you're taken deep into the bank's vault on a dangerous adventure and witness Harry, Ron and Hermione break into the bank to retrieve the Horcrux to help defeat Lord Voldemort. For our second attraction within the Universal Studios Wizarding World, we're back to the London waterfront over on the San Francisco side for the Hogwarts Express which I should highlight guests can only use if they have a park-to-park -park ticket, as this attraction doubles as a form of transportation to islands of adventure. Guests are bound for Platform 9 and 3 quarters, but its passage is concealed to muggles, with guests forced to walk through a solid brick wall. After a short wait on the platform, you'll be invited to board the steaming Hogwarts Express train. Once it starts moving, you'll want to keep your eyes on the frosted glass doors and the train windows for some fun projections throughout the ride as you pass through the streets of London and the Scottish countryside. Guests will depart the trains at a station within the Wizarding Village of Hogsmeade in the Scottish Highlands, the original Wizarding World of Harry Potter land within Universal Orlando. I should mention you can travel in the opposite direction from the station with a different ride experience. But for now, we're going to explore Hogsmeade Village, entering through a grand stone archway, which reveals the village shopping and dining hub filled with stone cottages and shops with snowy slate roofs and crooked chimneys. On your right past the steaming Hogwarts Express train is Hogsmeade's headliner attraction, Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure, a launched steel roller coaster, the longest coaster in Florida and one of the most expensive ever built. Depending on crowd levels, Universal may adopt a virtual line system, I'll leave a link in the description explaining how this works. After dropping off all your belongings at the lockers, riders begin a walking tour of the gardens before entering the ruins alongside the Forbidden Forest. 
Upon entering the boarding station, you'll board trains that resemble Hagrid's vintage motorbike, complete with hanging sidecars. After exiting, guests enjoy the first launch through the castle ruins before meeting up with Hagrid and his creatures in an abandoned hut. Another launch leads guests to a vertical spike before a backward helix into darkness. North of the village stands the towering Hogwarts castle, flanked by the Forbidden Forest. In Hogsmeade, you'll find another Ollivander's Wand shop, and guests can queue for the popular wand-choosing ceremony experience. Ollivander's, as well as several other stores in the Wizarding World, sell interactive wands, which can be used for the many spell-casting locations scattered around both the Wizarding World lands. A few steps from Ollivander's, you'll find a stage which hosts regular performances of the Frog Choir, an a cappella group, as well as the Tri-Wizard Spirit Rally martial arts performers. A trip to the Wizarding World wouldn't be complete without a pint of butterbeer. For those that don't know, you can get butterbeers in cold, frozen and hot varieties. So next, we're going to head past the castle entrance for the Flight of the Hippogriff Outdoor Junior Roller Coaster, based on the magical creature which first appears in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Whilst pretty short and not the most thrilling, it features a cool recreation of Hagrid's hut and offers incredible views of Hogsmeade. For our final attraction within Hogsmeade, we'll head straight for the castle for the Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey motion simulator dark ride. Guests approach the castle's imposing winged gates beneath Hogwarts Castle, set upon an elevated cliff which beckons you inside. The queue is one of the most elaborate ever created, taking guests past numerous landmarks with talking portraits and famous artefacts such as the Sorting Hat. Guests board the moving ride vehicles that levitate with the help of Hermione when your adventure begins through many famous locations around Hogwarts with visits from famous characters and creatures from the movies. In the evening on select nights, guests can celebrate the four houses of Hogwarts with an amazing show of music and light with the nighttime lights at Hogwarts Castle, a five minute projection mapping show narrated by the Sorting Hat with the iconic John Williams score and a brief fireworks finale. Since we arrived to Hogsmeade via the Hogwarts Express, I've technically already started our tour of Islands of Adventure, which opened in 1999 and transformed Universal Studios into the multi-day vacation destination. It remains themed around a journey of exploration containing eight thematically diverse lands, or islands as they're known as here, spread around its large central lagoon. Day guests will arrive at Islands of Adventure via the West Bridge at City Walk beneath the Pharos Lighthouse, one of the park's main icons, which sends out a bright beam to lead visitors to and from the park's gates. Once you're past the turnstiles, you'll arrive at the exotic port of entry island with theming drawn from Middle Eastern, Asian and Mediterranean styles and a stone archway which commands the order of the day. At the top of Port of Entry, you'll find one of the best views of the park, which gives you a taste of the adventures that lie ahead. From this point in my tour, we're going to travel clockwise from Hogsmeade, which I've already covered, so that would take us to the Lost Continent, which was once one of Islands of Adventure's largest islands, but as with San Francisco, it was largely annexed by the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, leaving only the Arabian and Ancient Greek portions intact. Despite these setbacks, the Lost Continent remains gloriously themed and contains the award-winning Mythos Table Service restaurant with its stunning exterior, featuring lavish waterfalls that pour down the ancient rocks. You also have the interactive Mystic Fountain which talks to guests. The island's sole attraction is the Poseidon's Fury walkthrough theatre show. Possibly the most impressive thing about Poseidon's Fury is its exterior. Guests enter through the imposing broken statue remains of Poseidon's arm holding a trident before arriving at the Sea God's ancient temple. You'll be led by a nerdy archaeologist through a series of chambers within the ancient, crumbling temple of Poseidon, who eventually takes you through an awe-inspiring water tunnel before you find yourself caught up in a fight between Poseidon and Lord Darkanon, with only Poseidon able to get you out alive. For our next land south of the Lost Continent, we're headed back towards the entrance next to the port of entry for Seuss Landing Island, based on Dr. Seuss's famous children's books, with buildings and attractions that replicate a whimsical, brightly coloured cartoon style with exaggerated features and rounded lines, and features many of Dr. Seuss's most beloved characters. We'll start at the top of the island for the High in the Sky Seuss Trolley Train Ride, just past the gates for the Lost Continent. This is a slow-moving trolley ride that slides along elevated tracks throughout Seuss Landing with themed audio which tells guests a story as you ride with fantastic views of the lagoon and its surrounding islands. Located in the middle of Seuss Landing is the Cara Seuss L Gentle Merry-Go-Round Carousel Ride that incorporates non-traditional mounts and music to provide a Seussian feel. Riders can use controls and reins to make some of the characters move, blink and more. 
Towards the bottom of the island and past the Circus McGurkis Cafe Stupendous is the colourful One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish aerial carousel ride. Ride vehicles are shaped like fish and rotate around a centre point with riders able to raise their fish 15 feet in the air. At the bottom, close to the entrance when travelling from Port of Entry is the Cat and the Hat Dark Ride. Very difficult to miss with its giant red and white striped hat entrance. This gentle dark ride retells the story of the same name with the cat in the hat and thing one and thing two causing mayhem, covering 18 scenes from the book. To finish our Seuss landing tour, we have the If I Ran the Zoo interactive outdoor play area where the young Gerald McCrew imagines what it would be like to have his own zoo filled with strange animals collected from exotic places around the world. It's now time to head east of the lagoon for the first time for Marvel Superhero Island, themed after popular Marvel comic superheroes, which guests travelling from the entrance will access over a short bridge. The architecture for the island is modelled after Marvel comics, including cutouts of many of the most popular Marvel characters. Despite Disney owning Marvel, Universal did acquire the rights for most Marvel characters in Florida before the acquisition. Our first attraction is also the island's most popular and intense, which is the Incredible Hulk coaster, themed around Bruce Banner and his famous alter ego, whose towering figure greets guests whilst holding up a salvaged piece of the old ride. Guests are required to drop off all of their belongings in the nearby lockers before entering the queue and the metal detectors. Once boarding the shiny green ride vehicles, guests enjoy one of the most intense roller coaster launches out there, going from 0 to 40 miles per hour in 2 seconds and flung upside down into a zero gravity barrel roll, with plenty more rolls and loops to follow, including a trip under an underground tunnel, one of Central Florida's most impressive roller coasters. A few steps away from the Hulk coaster entrance, you'll find the Storm Force Accelotron, an X-Men themed classic cup style spinning ride with a wheel at the centre to control how much or how little your pod spins during the ride. If we head north, we're going to take a left at the Kingpin's Arcade for Yancey Street, also known as Villain's Alley, and lead you to the Doctor Doom's fearful, towering thrill ride that revolves around Doctor Doom, who seeks to harness the fear of park guests by accelerating them up a 199-foot tower for a short but incredibly thrilling ride, which can be seen from miles around and provides guests with a great view of the park and surrounding areas by day and night. Next, we'll head north for the second headliner attraction within Marvel Superhero Island, which is the groundbreaking Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man 3D Simulator ride. The adventure begins with a trip to the Daily Bugle, where you get to see the workplace of Peter Parker. After boarding, you'll set off through New York City, with digital projections combined with real sets and props to immerse guests in the various dangers caused by the Marvel villains before Spidey comes to your rescue. Above Marvel Superhero Island is the vibrantly coloured Toon Lagoon Island, which is sort of the water park area for islands of adventure and often a way to counter Florida's sweltering heat. This whimsical land is themed around the Sunday morning newspaper comics of King Features Syndicate. Not exactly the most recognisable content for the kids of today, but has a charm that many really appreciate. Toon Lagoon contains three attractions. We'll start with Dudley Do Right's Ripsaw Falls Flume Ride, apparently based on the Royal Canadian mounted character Dudley Do Right. To get to the ride, guests must first navigate the lengthy queue that winds through Snidely Whiplash's hideout. Guests board log-shaped vehicles, which run along an underwater track through dark corridors before a number of medium-sized drops, which lead to a 75-foot drop that sends you plummeting into a large pool of water at the bottom of the sawmill. Be prepared to get very wet, much more so than Splash Mountain, so it might be best to grab a poncho or leave this one until later in the day, or you can just watch it from the bridge. Over the eastbound bridge in Toon Lagoon, you'll arrive at the Popeye and Bluto's Bilge Rat Barges Whitewater Raft Ride, located in the Sweet Haven section of Toon Lagoon. Guests start the experience by clambering into a 12-person barge, which sails down a man-made canyon of gushing rapids, waterfalls, twists and turns. You're almost certainly going to get completely soaked. On the off chance you manage to come off lightly, you'll often have to endure the water cannons fitted atop our next attraction which is the Me Ship the Olive, a three-storey interactive water playground with a ship. A great place to let the kids run off some steam. And as mentioned, cannons to spray the barges down below. So that finishes our tour of Toon Lagoon. Next, we'll head north over the Toon Lagoon Bridge, arriving at Skull Island, themed to the mysterious island inhabited by strange species, including King Kong. Barely qualifies as its own land with just one ride and a couple kiosks. Its sole attraction is the Skull Island Reign of Kong multi-dimension safari truck ride. Guests enter inside an ancient temple inhabited by a hostile Kong-worshipping indigenous tribe. 
The path inside the temple takes you to giant open-sided vehicles similar to the Fast and Furious ride. The ride begins with a short loop through the jungle, ending at the massive torch frame doors in the centre of Skull Island's imposing stony facade before encountering a number of prehistoric creatures projected on the 3D screens, including a battle between the T-Rex and King Kong. The ride finishes with a face-to-face -face encounter with a giant King Kong animatronic. It's now time to head north towards our final island at Islands of Adventure, located in between Hogsmeade and Toon Lagoon, which is of course Jurassic Park, an island based on Steven Spielberg's blockbuster movie series in which humans have recreated living and breathing dinosaurs spread around an island filled with tropical foliage and the sounds of John Williams' score through hidden speakers, as well as the odd prowling predator. When travelling from Toon Lagoon and Skull Island, the first attraction we come across is Camp Jurassic, which is a large and elaborate kids' playground. You can explore swaying suspension bridges, battle with cannons, and venture into caves that hold prehistoric secrets. Easily the most impressive of all Universal's playgrounds, the best place to let the kids run free during those busy midday hours at Universal. Based inside this playground lies the entrance to Pteranodon Flyers, which is a slow-moving family coaster designed for little ones, which provides the best views of the playground. This is a very gentle ride, so a good pick for any sensitive children, provided they're not afraid of heights. The cons for this ride are that it's very low capacity, so super long waits. Also, only guests riding with one child per adult can get on, and that child needs to be under 48 inches. As we exit Camp Jurassic, we're a short walk away from one of the park's original headliner attractions, the Jurassic Park River Adventure Raft Ride. The queue serves as a welcome to Jurassic Park, with a miniature island new blog greeting guests at the entrance before covered walkways that lead guests to their riverboat. Guests will travel through the Jurassic Park gate for a relaxing and smooth ride amongst the park's herbivore dinosaurs, but you're later knocked off course into a heavily damaged raptor containment will be taken up into the water treatment plant with sirens blazing before eventually coming face to face with the enormous T-Rex with your only escape being an 85 foot plunge into the unknown. If we continue our way towards the top of the park we'll arrive at the Raptor Encounter Meet and Greet attraction where you'll meet a Raptor expert who'll guide you through your interactions with the Raptors including Blue from Jurassic World as well as a baby Raptor that comes out from time to time. Next, we're going to walk towards the bottom of Jurassic Park for the Jurassic Park Discovery Center, one of the most recognizable symbols of the franchise. So this is the northern entrance for the top floor, and inside you have a great view of the central T-Rex skeleton. The more impressive entrance for the ground floor is on the south side next to the lagoon with its impressive fossil entrance facade. On the ground floor, you'll find interactive play center features and several areas where dino enthusiasts, young and old, can unearth mysteries of our planet's prehistoric past. And if you're lucky, you'll catch a baby Velociraptor being hatched right inside the lab. It's now time for the main headliner of Universal Orlando, which is of course the Jurassic World Veloci Coaster, located next to the Discovery Center on the shores of the lagoon, Universal's fastest roller coaster. The ride's backstory puts you in Jurassic World shortly before the events of the Jurassic World film, so before the arrival of the Indominus Rex. As you make your way through the entrance, you'll encounter two towering bronze raptor sculptures. Within the queue, you'll be feet away from the 70 miles per hour launch whilst raptors screech past you before meeting Delta and Echo caged and muzzled in the examination room. Following this, you'll arrive at the lockers with their unique two-way design, so you'll pick up your belongings after the ride on the other side of the wall. Once exiting the station, riders are launched 0 to 50 miles per hour in two seconds. Immediately after the launch, the train passes through the Isla Nublar rockwork with a number of twists and inversions before reaching the 155-foot top hat, which gives the illusion of flying over islands of adventure before dropping 140 feet down at 80 degrees. Following this, the ride enters its signature element, a heartline roll at 53 miles per hour, followed by an off-axis airtime hill before reaching the brake run conclusion. Well, that's both theme parks covered. If you've enjoyed the video so far, do consider hitting the like button to support the channel and subscribe so you don't miss out when future videos are posted. It would be awesome if I could hit 50,000 subs by the end of the year. But anyway, we still have a 28-acre water park to go through known as Volcano Bay, which opened back in 2017. 
The theme of the park is around the culture of the Watori Islanders who happened to stumble across this tropical paradise and decided to make it their home before adding all the slides and water experiences that make up the park today. To get to Volcano Bay, day guests will arrive through the CityWalk transportation hub where you'll find regular buses taking you to its entrance. At the turnstiles, you'll be handed a Tapu Tapu wristband, which is used to make payments inside the park, but more importantly, they're used to tap into the virtual queue for each slide. So unlike other water parks, you don't just enter the standby line, you'll only be able to enter the line after you've waited in the virtual queue. I'll leave a link with more detailed info in the video description. Volcano Bay consists of four separate villages, which are Wave Village, Krakatau Volcano, the River Village, and the Rainforest Village. We'll start with the Wave Village nearest the park entrance. Once through the turnstiles and the winding pathway, the lush tropical oasis unfolds, transporting guests to a Polynesian paradise with dense palms and tiki carvings. Off in the distance, you'll get your first look at the towering 200-foot water and fire volcano surrounded by the Watori Beach Wave Pool with a stunning series of waterfalls that pour into the sparkling lagoon. Adjacent to the Waturi Beach is the Reef, providing guests with a more relaxing pool area and features its own private waterfall and an impressive view of one of the park's headliner slides, which is Kokiri Body Plunge, the joint tallest drop capsule slide. This one involves a 70 degree fall through a drop door down 125 feet of slide. Krakatau Volcano is not just there for the eye candy. Several slides travel through it, also containing caverns that guests can explore. Inside, you'll find colourful fountains surrounding Vol, the spirit of the mountain who converses with guests through a digital projection. If we continue our counterclockwise tour of the park, we'll come to River Village, most suitable for families and young visitors. First up is the Kopika Y Winding River, which is the centrepiece of this village and passes through the tropical landscape of Volcano Bay, including the Krakatau Volcano and its hidden caves. For those of you with any young children in your group, you'll want to check out Runamucca Reef, which is a three-storey coral reef-inspired water playground containing twisting slides, sprinklers and other fun features. You've also got the nearby Top Tiki Reef for the park's youngest guests. Lastly, for River Village, you have Onu and the Aika Moana multi-person raft slides. Despite being located in the child-friendly village, these stomach-dropping slides are certainly not short on thrills. To finish our Volcano Bay Village tour, we're headed west for the Rainforest Village, which contains the most adrenaline-pumping attractions. But the exception to this is the Puka Uli Lagoon, which is a small pool designed for swimming and relaxation. Nearby, you have the Ono oh and Oya oh drop slides, where you'll plummet down through twists and turns and soar out six feet above the 10-foot deep pool. Next, we have two more multi-person raft slides, which are Maku and Puihi. Maku features three high-banked saucer elements, and over on Puihi, you'll careen through the dark, winding cavern before exploding out into the far side of its funnel. At the heart of the rainforest village is the Tiawa the Fearless River, which you'll need a life vest for, as its roaring whitewater rapids throw you down the river amongst chopping waves beneath the slides inside the volcano. Next, we have Taniwa Tubes, which consists of four separate Easter Island-inspired slides, all similar but not identical. The best thing about these slides is that they're always ride now, so no need to queue with your Tapu Tapu. Towards the centre of the park, we have Punga Races, where single rider guests are sent on their manta ray mats, sliding down four lanes through underwater sea caves. Next, we'll take the 200-step climb for Kala and Tai Nui, which are high-speed body slides that traverse the Krakatau Volcano, the joint tallest drop capsule slides in the world, featuring trapdoor starts, sending guests through 125 feet of twists and turns. The final slide for Volcano Bay is the headliner Krakatau Aqua Coaster, a unique slide that combines both roller coaster and water slide elements and propels your four-person raft canoe uphill using induction motors and through dark twists and turns. Whilst you may be primarily interested in seeing the theme parks, no guests visiting Universal Orlando will be able to avoid the City Walk Central Hub with pretty much everything connected to it. City Walk is, in a nutshell, Universal shopping, dining and entertainment complex similar to Disney Springs over in Disney World. I tend to separate it into two main areas divided by the main water taxi lagoon. To the north of this, you have both theme park entrances and a couple headliner restaurants in between the parks. Then south of the lagoon, you'll find the vast majority of the bars, restaurants and shopping, etc. 
In terms of getting to City Walk, day guests will be signposted to one of the two giant multi-storey parking structures linked to City Walk after the main toll. At the time of making this video, parking costs $27 per car, but it is free after 6 p.m. After getting through the toll, you'll be directed over to one of the parking structures. Guests headed for Volcano Bay will be separated at this point, so be sure to keep an eye on the signage. These two parking structures contain over 19,000 spaces. Universal has helpfully split them up into themed sections. Highly recommend that you take a picture of the row you're parked at to avoid disaster at the end of the day. For those travelling via Uber or Lyft, you'll be dropped off and picked up from the Jurassic Park section in the designated Uber waiting area, but the Lyft service will also use this area. There are a few other options of getting to City Walk for resort guests, which I'll be covering in part four. But most guests are dropped off at City Walk behind the main security screening. And once through this, you'll be directed to City Walk's famous moving walkway. We'll start with shopping and activities. One of the first things that guests will come across is the Hollywood Drive-In Golf, containing two 18-hole mini golf courses, the 50s sci-fi themed Invaders from Planet Put, and the horror flick themed Haunting of Ghostly Greens. A few steps away, next to the main City Walk entrance bridge, is the Cinemark Movie Theatre, where visitors can catch new releases on 20 cinema screens. City Walk's newest entertainment offering is their great movie Escape Rooms, housed in the former Groove nightclub, featuring adventures based on Back to the Future and Jurassic World. For your shopping needs, the most popular location is the Universal Studios store, which allows you to pick up a variety of Universal souvenirs, including a substantial Harry Potter section. The second most popular shopping choice is the Universal Legacy Store, which sells retro-themed merchandise and familiar props and costumes featured at the parks in years past. I think it's fair to say City Walk is most famous for its dining options, which are better than those in the parks, although I will say not quite up to the same standard as Disney Springs. For this part of the video, I'll do a super quick breakdown of the most popular locations at City Walk, as well as the theme parks, in reverse order of their online ratings, excluding some of the less interesting fast food chains. We'll do quick service followed by the table service options in City Walk before doing the same for the two theme parks. Which means we'll start in City Walk with Ben the Bow at number four, which serves a variety of fluffy bow and sake, as well as other less notable options. A little too pricey, hence the low review ranking. For number three, over on the west side of City Walk, we have the Hot Dog Hall of Fame, which serves a variety of hot dogs and toppings themed after iconic baseball stadiums around the US. For number two, we have Breadbox Handcrafted Sandwiches, which serves gourmet hot and cold deli sandwiches, my personal favorite quick service choice. Then at number one is Voodoo Donuts, which serves a number of creative donuts with an eye-catching interior. Good choice for families in search of a snack on a tight budget. Moving on now to the table service restaurants in City Walk, again in reverse order of their online rating. At number 10 is Red Oven Pizza Bakery, an open air pizza restaurant serving Neapolitan pizzas within a 900 degree stone lined oven, the best place for pizzas at Universal. For number 9 we have NBC Sports Grill and Brew, containing 100 TV screens to immerse guests in a stream of sports coverage as you drink and dine with a giant menu and giant portion sizes. At number 8 is the vibrantly coloured Antojitos authentic Mexican food restaurant designed to be a celebration of Mexican culture serving tapas style dishes and an extensive selection of custom cocktails. Next at number 7 we have Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville restaurant, famous for its Caribbean inspired food and stacked burgers, cocktails and its volcano that erupts margarita lava. At number 6 we have the unique Cowfish Sushi Burger Bar with its unique decor that mixes Japanese and American culture featuring an excellent burger selection, sushi and combinations of both. For number 5 we have the steampunk and chocolate themed Toothsome Chocolate Emporium and Savoury Kitchen serving American fare but most famous for its extravagant sundaes and milkshakes. At number 4 is Big Fire with its rustic outdoors vibe reminiscent of lakeside summer vacations specialising in open fire cooking with flame grilled meats, one of the better value places to get a steak at Universal. For number 3 next door to Cowfish is Vivo Italian Kitchen specialising in familiar Italian dishes with a modern twist. Amongst its modern and sleek furnishings is its open expo kitchen with pasta, mozzarella and pizza freshly made before your eyes. The second best restaurant according to Google reviews is Bubba Gump Shrimp Company Restaurant and Market themed to the Bubba Gump character from Forrest Gump serving a versatile seafood menu. But the best table service restaurant according to Google reviews is the Hard Rock Cafe restaurant in between the two theme parks where music memorabilia takes centre stage and features a wide variety of American classics in hearty portions including burgers, sandwiches, salads and seafood. 
So as mentioned, CityWalk does provide the best dining options overall, but of course it's often not practical to lose time heading out of the parks to grab something to eat. So we'll go through five of the best dining options according to Google reviews for both parks. Given that the parks only have two table service restaurants each, I'll cover quick service and table service together. Starting over at Universal Studios at number five is the Today Cafe over in the Hollywood section themed to the long-running NBC morning show and offers a variety of light breakfast, lunch and dinner options. In my opinion, this is where you'll get the best coffee on property. At number four is the incredibly popular Leaky Cauldron over in Diagon Alley, serving traditional British fare at breakfast, lunch and dinner, with its interior modelled after the grubby pub and inn from the Harry Potter movies. This restaurant is very popular, so expect long waits to be seated. And the best quick service restaurant according to Google reviews is the Tex-Mex Cafe La Bamba. For breakfast, it's only open for VIP tour guests, but earlier this year, a lunch menu has been made available for general admission guests, which includes burritos, bowls, tacos, and salads. For the second best restaurant at Universal Studios, we'll head to the Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco for the nautical themed Lombard Seafood and Grill, specializing in seafood and offers great views of Springfield on the other side of the lagoon. But the trophy for the best restaurant at Universal Studios Florida has to go to Finnegan's Bar and Grill, located in the New York land. A lively Irish American themed locals favorite restaurant with live music, serving hearty Irish fare. If we make our way over to Islands of Adventure's dining lineup, at number five is the Three Broomsticks restaurant over in Hogsmeade, serving sort of British cuisine, but with some more standard barbecue options. As with the other Wizarding World restaurant in the other park, be prepared to wait longer compared with other options. At number four is Thunder Falls Terrace over in Jurassic Park, serving barbecue cuisine such as rotisserie chicken and ribs with both indoor and outdoor seating. Fantastic decoration inside with great views of the river adventure finale. The best quick service location for Islands of Adventure according to Google reviews is the Green Eggs and Ham Cafe located in Seuss Landing, which nowadays specializes in tater tot dishes, including buffalo chicken, pepperoni pizza, and its namesake Green Eggs and Ham varieties. For the table service options, we have Confisco Grill located over in the Port of Entry section, themed as an exotic haunt for traveling merchants and adventurers, serving up multiple cuisines with inspiration from Asian, Mexican, Mediterranean, and Greek dishes. Google Reviews has determined that the best table service restaurant at Islands of Adventure is the Greek mythology themed Mythos restaurant located over in the Lost Continent with its towering rock formations and cascading waterfalls. Within its equally impressive interior, Mythos serves a mixture of Mediterranean, Asian and American cuisine. Before we move on to the next part of the video, I did just want to mention the importance of booking your restaurant reservations. Whilst nowhere near as important compared to Disney World, often you can walk up to many of the Universal restaurants, but the likes of Finnegan's, Mythos, Marvel Character Dinner, and Toothsome will get booked up pretty quickly. So I'll leave a link to the page on how to make your reservations. Lastly, this feels like the right time to mention the Coca-Cola Freestyle Souvenir Cups, which you can purchase at certain dining locations with freestyle machines. Here's the current pricing to purchase one of these, with discounts on purchasing more than one cup. These allow you to get unlimited refills of a large number of soda varieties, including the frozen slushies, but only once every 10 minutes or so. It's worth crunching the numbers to see if you're likely to spend more than this individually per day on soda. Tickets for visiting Universal Orlando can be a little complicated, but essentially there's three things you need to decide on. So there's how many days you need to visit, whether you want to visit Volcano Bay at any point during your visit, and whether you want the option to visit more than one park in one day. This is called the Park to Park add-on, Universal's term for park hopping. So let's say you want to stay at Universal for four days with a visit to Volcano Bay on two of those days and I want to visit multiple parks on any given day. Then I'll click four days at the top. The park to park tickets automatically show at the top but I can filter these in or out if necessary. And then because I want to visit Volcano Bay as well, I'll click on the three park option. If you're wondering whether you need the park to park add-on, the answer is almost certainly yes, otherwise you won't be able to ride on the Hogwarts Express. Universal also offers a variety of annual pass options, which I'll link to in the video description. Probably the question I get asked the most is how many days do you need? This is kind of like asking how many voodoo donuts you should buy. It really depends on your appetite and budget. But if the question is how many days do you need to visit all attractions at the two theme parks, then two days is the minimum. But three days will make it a lot more relaxing and enjoyable. If you're going to add Volcano Bay in, then I wouldn't recommend less than four. After five days or donuts, you've probably had your fill. 
For guests in the UK and Ireland, the most popular ticket to purchase is the 14-day ticket, which I believe is exclusive to the European third-party ticket sellers. This comes with Volcano Bay and Park to Park access. The two market leaders for these tickets are Florida Ticks and Attraction Tickets, but you also have OrlandoAttractions.com, which has been the cheapest for Disney and Universal the last few times I've looked, which I've used for my next family trip in May. For those of you willing to spend money to save time at the parks, Universal provides a way to skip the lines for most of the attractions with its Express Pass system. Whilst more expensive compared to Disney's line skipping services, you don't need to make any reservations, you can just enter the line whenever you want. With this in mind, you'll get on far more rides using Express Pass compared to Disney's Genie Plus and Lightning Lane selections. There are three different varieties of Express Pass. You have the standard Universal Express Pass, which allows one person one ride on each participating attraction. The second is Universal Express Pass Unlimited, which allows one person an unlimited number of rides on participating attractions. The pricing for both of these is variable. So for example, you'll pay a lot more during spring break compared to the end of January. Lastly, you have the on-site hotel Universal Express Unlimited Pass, which guests staying at one of the three premier resorts will benefit from. However, the resort guest Express Passes are not valid at Volcano Bay. I'll be covering Hotel Unlimited Express Passes in more detail in the following hotel resort section. Important to note that none of the Express Passes offered by Universal will work at Universal's two most popular attractions, which are Velocicoaster and Hagrid's, something I'm very grateful for given how long the lines for Hagrid's can get. I'm often asked whether Express Passes are worth it. Again, it depends. It is undeniably great to have, but for my circumstances, it's very rarely worth the money. Because of the variable pricing, the days when I think I'd make good use of it, it's always too expensive. As is often the case with these sort of things, kind of comes down to how much time you have and what your budget is. For me, I found that just using an efficient itinerary makes more sense. For those that aren't aware, Universal hosts an incredibly popular Halloween event known as Halloween Horror Night in September and October. This is a separate ticketed event in Universal Studios Florida after the park closes. Many of the park's buildings will be transformed to heavily themed haunted houses and the park's avenues are transformed to scare zones all of which are updated every year to keep guests wanting to come back. So yeah, this is a separate ticketed event and the unlimited express passes you get at the Premier Resort won't work after the park closes for Horror Nights. So you'll need to buy a separate Horror Nights express pass. Given how long the queues can get for the houses, these do offer a lot of value. As touched on previously, since the beginning of the century, Universal has evolved from a theme park to a multi-day vacation destination with a hotel resort lineup that has grown to eight different hotels within four price categories, which are value, prime value, preferred and premier categories. In this part of the video, I'll provide a guide on what to expect when staying at each of these resorts, including the differences in amenities and perks. We'll begin by taking the journey out of the main Universal Resort Complex along Universal Boulevard and south of International Drive. This is where Universal's two valley resorts reside, which are the Endless Summer Surfside Inn and Suites to the west and the much larger Endless Summer Dockside Inn and Suites to the east. Both resorts contain a sunny seaside aesthetic, but Surfside has a brighter surf theming, whereas Dockside has a warmer colour scheme inspired by sunsets, docks and piers. Dockside has two large pools, whereas Surfside has one smaller pool. Both resorts offer affordable two-bedroom family suites. The distance to the parks may dissuade guests from staying at one of these resorts. However, both of these resorts provide frequent shuttle buses taking guests over to the parks throughout the day before and after the parks close much more efficient compared to Disney Resort hotel buses. Another perk that endless summer resorts get, as well as other on-site resorts, is early park admission, which allows you to enter one of the two theme parks an hour before day guests, which tends to be islands of adventure most of the time, with only Hogsmeade and Velocicoaster open. Early park admission also allows you to enter Volcano Bay half an hour early. Just like the parks, you can also buy Coke freestyle cups to use at the hotels, but these will require separate activation. The Endless Summer Resorts offer incredible value when visiting Universal. However, the walls are a little on the thin side. It's not uncommon to overhear arguments amongst other things in the neighboring guest rooms. For the prime value resort category, we need to head back towards the main complex, up Universal Boulevard and onto Adventure Way. 
We'll start with Universal's Cabana Bay Beach Resort, themed to Florida beach resorts from the 1950s and 60s, located next door to Volcano Bay with its own special entrance to the water park. It features two giant pool areas, one with a water slide and the other with a lazy river. There's also a bowling alley on its second floor. Cabana Bay also offers affordable family suites which sleep up to six guests and more space than the endless summer resort. In addition to having a special entrance to Volcano Bay, you can get to the parks by foot using the beautiful shaded garden walkway, which all other resorts excluding the endless summer resorts are connected to. On the other side of Adventure Way, we have the other hotel in the Prime Valley Resort category, which is the Aventura Hotel, a modern 17-story curved all-glass Y-shaped tower, the smallest hotel on property. No real theming here, but it does focus on technology such as the iPads fitted into every room and its relay robot which can deliver items to your room. Aventura Hotel also has a special entrance to Volcano Bay and its rooftop bar 17 Bistro is another highlight. The main downside to Aventura is its small pool with no slide, definitely a resort that is geared towards budget conscious childless couples. Next door to Aventura is Lowe's Sapphire Falls Resort, on its own in the preferred resort category and themed to a serene Caribbean getaway in the heart of the tropics set around a lagoon and waterfalls. Despite not offering express passes, the pool area at Sapphire Falls punches above its weight with its amenities, in particular the water slide through Caribbean inspired waterfalls and rock features. Arguably the biggest selling point for Sapphire Falls is its incredible water taxi transportation which takes guests on a scenic trip through the lush foliage of the garden walkway under bridges before arriving at Universal Studios in around 7 minutes. Moving on now to the premier resort category for Lowe's Royal Pacific Resort which is closer to CityWalk and the theme parks which is one of the main perks of paying the premium on a premier resort. For those planning to spend most of their time at Islands of Adventure, Royal Pacific is the closest to that particular park. The theming for Royal Pacific is inspired by the golden age of air travel when the South Seas were opened up to island hopping world travellers. Guests enter the resort on a bridge above an artificial stream. Royal Pacific has arguably the best themed pool area surrounded by palm trees and lush plants. Whilst there's no water slide here, it instead provides an interactive water play area for kids. The main perk for staying at Royal Pacific or any other premier resort is of course getting unlimited express passes for every guest staying in your room. The way this works is your hotel key will combine as your unlimited express pass. So let's say you arrive at your hotel at 6am on the day you're checking in. Whilst your room won't be available, you can drop your luggage off and they'll give you a room key card that will act as your unlimited express passes so you can head out for early park admission that day using your unlimited express passes. These express passes won't expire until both theme parks close on the day you're checking out so you can see why a lot of Universal fans will often book a cheaper resort for the majority of their stay then book one night at a premier resort so that everyone staying in the room gets two full days worth of Universal express passes. If express passes are important to your trip, I would definitely consider doing this. For our next premier resort, we need to travel through CityWalk and past both theme parks to the east of Universal Studios, where you'll find the smaller Hard Rock Hotel, which is the resort closest to this park. Themed in the style of a Rockstar's mansion with Californian mission-style architecture. Inside, guests listen to a carefully selected playlist of rock classics synced throughout the resort, which is also filled with iconic music, memorabilia and art. Whilst not as tropical as Royal Pacific, the Hard Rock's pool area is very easy on the eye and it has the best pool atmosphere and also contains a water slide. For our final hotel resort, we need to head to the east of Universal Studios and the Hard Rock, arriving at the luxurious Lowe's Portofino Bay, which is modelled on the seaside village of Portofino, nestled around a man-made picturesque harbour to immerse guests in a romantic Mediterranean escape. Portofino Bay boasts the best amenities on property with seven different dining options, most of which are spread around the harbour piazza, as well as three different swimming pools, including the Mediterranean themed beach pool and Roman aqueduct water slide feature. I should also mention that the rooms are the largest on property. Well that's it for this video, well done for making it this far, thank you for watching. If you're also visiting the House of Mouse, I previously did a similar hour long Disney World guide. Lastly, if you're interested in future Orlando vacation content, don't forget to subscribe.